Hi everyone, welcome to Women Atheist on Know, the show produced by Skeptic Helen. Tonight we're having a very special guest uh, that I love to talk to, uh, Dara Ray, and we are going to talk about exorcism. So before we start, please, if you haven't done uh, already yet, like, subscribe, share this uh, amazing show that we're going to have tonight, and I see you in a bit. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit. I got no love, and the fake is if you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll go show up. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit. I got no love, but the fake is if you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll go show up and make a statement. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit. I got no love, but the fake is if you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a Everything I do, so instinctive and so passionate Every word I move, so descriptive like an adjective I got a vendetta against people who patent it Being negative when you should be getting after it I got facts over facts over tracks, this and that Hello! Uh, hi everyone, thanks for being here uh, Welcome to Charlotte with my co-host tonight uh, Hi Charlotte, how have you been? I've been doing okay Great. And Dr. Daryl Ray. Hi. Hey, good to be back. Hi. Uh, it's really, really good to have you uh, here. Um, so I know for a fact that there is someone in the chat today and someone who is going to watch who doesn't know who you are. So who the hell are you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm a psychologist. I'm author of a couple books, The God Virus, uh, Sex and God, and I'm um, the founder of Recovering from Religion and a Psychotherapy Project, which I hope I get to talk a little bit about today. And uh, yes. uh, I don't know, what else? Um, I, I'm a traveler, I like traveling all over the world, and I just got back from Australia a month ago, touring and speaking on religious traumas. Um, uh, my talk was religious trauma and your brain, the, the neuropsychology of trauma and religion. So anyway, one, one of my favorite topics right now is talking about that subject, religious trauma. Yeah. So um, recovering from religion, what does what does it do exactly? It uh, our, our mission is to give, provide hope, healing and support to those do, dealing with issues of doubt and non-belief. That's our motto. That's our mission. And we we have a chat line. We have a phone line. People can literally call us from anywhere on the planet uh, by phone or a web call, or they can chat in from anywhere on the planet. And we do get chats literally from virtually every every country on the, uh, in the world uh, calling us uh, from every religion in the world, from Hinduism to Christianity to Islam to Scientology. People call and say, you know, what do I do? I've just left my religion. Or I raised my kids in Baptist church and now I'm an atheist. What do I do? Uh, there, there's any number I'm, you know, I'm, I'm married to a Catholic and now I'm not anymore, or I'm not a Catholic anymore. What do I do? So we're here not to advise, but to listen and, and provide resources. And we, to that end, we have a huge resource database uh, that's very well vetted so that it's uh, relevant to each area and we can help you deal with child rearing issues, marriage issues, deconversion issues, religious trauma issues, you name it, we've got a resource probably for it. And we've got a whole 441 well-trained uh, well trained volunteers that will answer the call, the phone or the chat. And they're trained to meet you where you are on your journey and to help you find your own way. We don't find it for you and we don't advise you. Uh, we think the best solution to any problem is the solution you come up with yourself, not not the one we come up with. So that's that's what Recover from Religion does, and we do a lot of other things I could talk about, but that's kind of the uh, the major overview. Cindy, thanks thanks for asking. So um, I, I have another question re relating to uh, recovering from religion. Um, I know you've been expanding since you created the um, this uh, nonprofit. But also at the same time, you observe that, uh, especially in the US, the number of people who leave religion uh, is increasing. So 
were you able, able to measure uh, an increase in activity regardless of your increase in in size and uh, and volunteers wow that's a real hard question to uh, answer because there's really not much of a way to quantify it we do know from many surveys the pew uh, memorial trust survey shows that religion is in dramatic decline it's it's gone down <laughs> almost yearly and uh, we know the pandemic caused a lot of problems and so I, I guess anecdotally, what I will say is our call volume and our chat volume skyrocketed during the pandemic. And fortunately for us, so did our volunteer applications. So we grew, we grew faster in the pandemic, the two years of the pandemic than we probably had in the previous five years. <laughs> and we'd been, we'd on a, we were on a very steady growth until we hit the pandemic. So I can say we benefited from the pandemic uh, in, in getting more volunteers and, you know, a lot, a lot of positive things happen. One of the uh, one of the negative things that happened to the planet was religion uh, was still there and causing people problems. I mean, what if you have to go home from college and live with your religious family uh, that you thought you had left behind? But now the pandemic came and you've got to. We've got we got several calls from like South Africa college students say I thought I'd gotten rid of my evangelical family and then I had to go back to them, so that led to a big jump in people calling and chatting with us, and we've we've seen a continuous in, increase in those um, in in the need for that service. But we don't know if it's because people are finding out about us through shows like this, well, or if there's actually a lot more people needing our services. I can't, I can't tell which it is. Yeah. Is that, an, that's a non-answer to your question. How's that? No, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, as I said in the preview, yeah, it's, uh, I, I assume it's, it's going to be very hard because there's a lot of parameters in there. And so isolating one to measure it would, would be, would be very hard. Yeah, it is. Yep. And just one last question. And then I, I let, I'm going to let Charlotte uh, ask you any anything if she wants to. Um, is there any region in the world where, where you need more volunteers, where you, you sense that you would have uh, more impact in, in the way you, you can help if you had more, more volunteers? Whoa, I love that question. I'll, I don't think anybody's ever asked that one, but I got an answer for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, we need, uh, I can think of a couple places. We have a few volunteers in Eastern Europe. We, we actually have a, vol a really good volunteer in Romania. We've got another really good volunteer in Lithuania. But we could use volunteers in other places like, like Poland. Uh, probably aren't going to get any volunteers from Ukraine. <laughs> we yeah. do have a volunteer who works. He is an incredible volunteer working from Syria, of all places. I mean, it's... he. He's in a dangerous situation, and yet he volunteers a lot for us. And we're just thrilled to have, have him. But anyway, uh, Eastern Europe, the Middle East would be two areas, I would say. We get a lot of calls from Arab-speaking countries and Arabic countries and predominantly Muslim countries, Turkey, for example. We do get calls, uh, chats from Saudi Arabia. You would be surprised at how many chats we get from places like Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. I mean, we won't get a lot, but we we get enough that we could we could use some, um, you know, pe people with other language skills in that area. Um, local and, representation. And the third third place we could use some volunteers is India. We know there are we get chats and calls from India, but not very often. We just think if we had a way to expand and raise awareness in India, <laughs> there's a lot of people leaving Hinduism. There's a lot of people leaving. Uh, Islam and Christianity inside of India, and we know our resources could really help them. So anyway, that's my answer. Those three places, please send yep. us more, more uh, volunteers. And I, I would should say while I'm while I've got the floor here, we uh we are having our big annual fundraiser coming up. Um, the line is actually doing it for us, but we're looking to raise twenty five thousand dollars. And we actually have a very generous donor who's going to match up to five thousand dollars for our our fundraiser. So we would really love it if people would go 
to recoverfromreligion.org and uh, and hit the donate button and help us raise funds for what we do. Because everything I've just described, Cindy, is free. We don't charge a dime for anything that we do. We are an all volunteer organization. Uh, you know, if, if it gets done, it was done by a volunteer. So we need funds in order to survive. We need funds to raise awareness. Uh, you know, the, the stuff that we do every day requires um, technical backup and IT backup. So, and the, the last thing I should mention is that we have our annual uh, fall excursion coming up in September. Uh, and it's a, it's like a retreat only it's not like a church retreat. We don't do that shit. So uh, it, it'll be in the hills of uh, East Tennessee. I'm sorry to say, because with what happened in Tennessee lately, I wish we weren't, but you know, we paid money up front to get it, but uh, it'll be a place where, you know, 80, hundred people can all come together and listen to each other's stories and hear some good speakers and, Enjoy the great outdoors, and we got two big, lot beautiful lodges right up in the mountains. Um, one we call the Quiet Lodge, the other the Noisy Lodge. We'll have karaoke in the Noisy Lodge, <laughs> uh, among other things. So it's it's going to be a great time. We've done it for four years, uh, four out of the last five. We we didn't have it during COVID, but so that's that's a big thing coming up uh, coming up in September. Okay. Charlotte? Um, well, I, I, it sounds like that's um, really an amazing service that you're providing um, and, and badly needed. I think there's a lot of people who maybe don't, you know, are starting to question things or have lost belief entirely and and are not sure where to go from there. Um, yeah. So that sounds like it's a really, really helpful thing. Um, we get a lot of ex-Catholics, by the way, Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, I bet you do. There's a lot of us out there, a lot of uh, the recovering Catholics. Recovering, recovering Catholics, yep. Yeah. Um, so just to sort of tag it back to the 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 theme of the show, um, what is there in, in, in do you, would you say that exorcism is um, one of the, what is it about exorcism that makes it uh, especially damaging, do you think? For, to people uh, I think exorcism is one of the most sophisticated forms of religious abuse ever invented. And it has so many, it has many different manifestations and, and techniques, but almost all of the techniques are psychologically the opposite of what you should do for somebody who's got a mental illness or in crisis or has been in some way abused in a, in a way that has really disoriented them towards reality. And as, uh, exorcism simply takes somebody's weakness and takes advantage of, it, of that weakness, uh, that, that stress, that PTSD, because it's probably almost... <laughs> I would say most of the time, if somebody's under a hell of a lot of distress, it's probably led to or comes from PTSD. And uh, what if somebody who's doing an exorcism, whether it's a Catholic priest or an Islam mullah or you know whoever, they're just taking advantage of a vulnerable person. It is a horrible way to abuse somebody. Almost so weaponizing that, their symptoms, actually. Pardon? They're almost weaponizing their symptoms. They're using their own ab symptoms. Ab ab absolutely right. Plus, plus they have the Catholic Church have this fiction that they put out there. Uh, I've literally watched a, a dozen talks and uh, and speakers talk about the Catholic practice of exorcism from the Catholic perspective, and every one of them say we don't perform an exorcism before we get a psychiatric and uh, uh, assessment first and that's bullshit they do not send anybody off to a to a psychiatrist to get assessed and the psychiatrist says yeah i can't help you send them to the exorcist what psychiatrist does that i've never i've never seen or heard of that and if they I, did, I they patient psych for 15 years and i have never ever seen anybody diagnosed with demon possession yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say that. so what 
what the Catholic Church is, is doing is it's just lying. They're they're lying about their their with respect to their liability. They're saying, oh, we're we we care for this person. That's why we get a psychiatric assessment first. And some of them even say nine out of ten our mental illness should be treated by a psychiatrist. But that one out of ten should get an exorcism. Well, no psychiatrist is going to send a patient to an exorcist. They should have their license and probably would have their license taken away if that's if that's what the treatment they recommended. So the Catholic Church is just lying. There's no other way around it. And the second thing is there's a lot of exorcism going on in South America and in Africa by the Catholic Church. So do you really think the Catholic Church is sending anybody to a psychiatrist before they do an exorcism? No, they're not. And the Protestants have really gotten into this exorcism stuff, too, in Brazil and in, in uh, Central Africa. But those people certainly aren't sending anybody off to it. And sometimes these exorcisms turn violent. I mean, violent with the use of, of weapons, even, to hurt the person, to beat them. And so there's been exorcisms in Central Africa that have ended in the death of children. Why the hell is a child being accused of being demon possessed, having an exorcism done on them in such a way that it, it kills them or, or severely damages them? And, and in, in any event, the poor kid or human that's finished with this exorcism is probably going to experience PTSD, maybe for the rest of their life. So that's my uh, that's my sermon there, Charlotte. Mm. We we have a video clip that we're going to, to play. Uh, can you give a little bit of context before we do that? Yes, I got a I got a phone call from ABC News. Um, they said that we're doing a show on exorcism. We want a psychologist to talk about the psychological side. So um, I went into a studio here in Kansas City, and they had the cameras all set up. And I, um, they asked me a whole bunch of questions remotely, you know, just like we're talking. I answered them all. I I did a at least it was at least an hour interview telling them all sorts of stuff about the problems with exorcism. And as you'll see, you're only, we're only going to see a tiny portion of the interview of the show that was on ABC news uh, that was on night lines, what it was, but the ABC cut out 90, maybe 95% of everything I said. And they certainly cut out the things that I said that were most critical and most important to the points I was making. But, you know, you expect that with uh, editing. Unfortunately, it was you come at the end of this clip. If you re watch the whole thing, and I think you guys will put up the link. You come to the end of it and wonder, well, maybe exorcism is legitimate. Uh, I have no patience for, for that. But anyway, that's the uh, introduction there, Cindy. Wes, you can go. A spiritual battle. That's what the experience of exorcism feels like to those who go through it. Speak the truth. Speak the truth. And those who perform it. I do it because I think it's an incredibly profound opportunity to help in the healing ministry that this is fundamentally about. And in a ministry where people are suffering tremendously. Father Gary Thomas is an exorcist, though he did not perform Becky Parker's exorcism. That priest preferred to remain anonymous. This is Jesus. But Father Gary was trained in Rome, and for the past several years, he's been the official exorcist of the Diocese of San Jose, California. Father, is the devil real? I do believe the devil is real. I've had occurrences and experiences in my life where I believe I've seen the devil. I've seen demons but you don't see Satan in the same way that you and I are looking at each other. There's plenty of evil in the world. God knoweth that, you might say. Plenty of cruelty, mayhem, and murder. But the devil? Satan is a pure spirit. He's an angel who fell. Certainly when I've been involved in the ministry of, of exorcism and at times prayed with people who have had a demonic attachment. I have seen Satan. I have never met a psychiatrist that came to the conclusion the person was uh, possessed by a demon.
Daryl Ray speaks for the other side, the secular take on these matters as a psychologist and atheist who thinks exorcism is not just a fantasy, but a dangerous one. We're diagnosing diseases now with brain scans that we couldn't diagnose even two and three years ago. What will happen in four or five years? The brain is an incredibly complicated organ. Uh, but the fact that some priest using 12th century technology can cure somebody is absurd. Faith versus doubt, the sacred versus the profane, that's the age-old conflict that exorcism crystallizes. And it's the conflict at the heart of the latest Hollywood take on the subject, the right. Now, the interesting thing about skeptics, atheists, is that uh, we're always looking for proof, certainty. The question is, what on earth would we do if we found it? Anthony Hopkins in a bravura performance plays an exorcist, Colin O'Donohue, a young seminarian full of skepticism at the right. That's not the devil. It's just a very, very sick girl. She doesn't need a priest. She needs a shrink. Thanks. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to, to, to unpack here. Um, so do, do we have any idea of when this practice started? You, you say in the, in the video, 12th century, do we have any records of anything going like this before that? You muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, we, we do. All you have to do is look in the New Testament. There, Jesus did exorcisms. That's probably where the, at least the Christian side of the exorcism came from. But there's records of exorcism and proof of exorcism in all, all sorts of religions. It's not just Catholicism. The evangelicals, as I mentioned earlier, are have gotten into it. The Pentecostals have been doing exorcism for years. Mm -hmm. And then you look at, you look at a, a religion like, like Scientology, it's based on the notion of exorcism uh, that we all are possessed by some kind of a thetan, a, a, de a demon. So there's lots of religions. Hinduism has them. Islam has a whole section dedicated to how you do exorcism. And there's even a, uh, Quranic, Quranic verses and chapters, sutras that are read during exorcisms during in Islam. So, yeah, it's been going on for thousands of years, um, probably way predates even uh, Christianity, because where where the so-called Jesus figure learn it? You know, he probably learned it from some practice before that. Um, there's lots of crazy things going on in Judaism about that time, so... Who knows where it came from? Yeah, um, we 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 know that um, the, the, this idea that uh, the, the way we think comes from something outside the body, and so the 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 fact that this can be hijacked by some evil force that's that's very very ancient. Right, right. Since we we've only understood how the brain works or even had the basic understanding of the brain works just in the last hundred years, uh, or you could even argue less, but what, how were people talking about what we would now know as mental illness in, in the 1840s? You know, they called it, um, Oh gosh, I forget the word now. <laughs> uh, malaise, you know, they talk about malaise or uh, melancholy there was very primitive terms for what they were observing and they didn't know how to treat it. I mean, you look at how uh, Vincent van Gogh, for example, who is, who knows, I can't diagnose him, but he could have been schizophrenic. He, he could have been bipolar. We don't, we don't know for sure, but look at how he was treated. There was no science there. He was just put into a, an asylum where he cut off his ear, you know, ultimately uh, died by suicide so it was a it was a poor way to treat somebody the alternative at least at that point in time in the 1800s was probably to call up a priest and let him do an exorcism you know it, it's probably going to work i mean it's a placebo effect it might work once out of every 10 times and so the priest thinks oh i cured him now, if you had to watch this 
if you to watch this whole clip, which we don't have time to do, you will see this woman spending an entire minutes during the clip in an in incredible physical expression of her of her uh, distress. I mean, it's at, at one point you'll see three people holding her down. Well, at, after about 30 minutes or however long this went of holding her down and the priest holding his hand on her head and, you know, saying his incantations, you know, he just goes on and on for 30 minutes or maybe an hour. The poor person is probably so exhausted at the end of it that they feel relief. And of course, they interpret that relief as the demon has now, the demon has left me. It's a it's a perfectly normal response to being stressed physically. It's like running a marathon. You know, you get up runner's high, if you will. Dor endorphins start flowing. I, I went way off topic on your question there, I think, uh, Cindy. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that was uh, on point. Um, yeah, I... Uh, Charlotte, I, I would be curious about your experience. Uh, as a, you were a psychiatric nurse. Yeah. You, yeah, you and, and I, you and I, I've been in a psychiatric hospital my early career. So you and I have some good experience. Yeah. There. And I mean, I've definitely seen some things, some people acting in ways that, um, I guess, if you wanted to put a religious spin on it, sure, you could interpret it as being possessed by a demon because they're acting very bizarrely. Um, of course, putting having a priest lay hands on them is not how we what we do for them that's not an effective treatment for it at all um and you know i, I think of like you know bipolar mania or schizophrenia and things like that can be extremely they present with extremely disruptive behaviors that you know the person can't necessarily help or it's just in response to like hearing voices in their head which are not caused by demons but uh, sometimes they believe they are. So mm -hmm. you might even get some buy-in from them that they need an exorcism or something of that nature, because a lot of, you know, delusions, you probably know, there are a lot of delusions that tend to be religious in nature. They are, right. So And, and, yeah. I, and interestingly, they're almost always religious in nature with respect to the culture they are occurring in. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Hindus, Hindus don't have Christian delusions. <laughs> <laughs> funny how that works. Yeah, funny how that works. Yeah. But you're, um, you're right. I'm, I'm sure. You, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say more than anything else, it almost just seems like that exorcism is really, it's just, it's like another tool for control, really. It's like you are engaging in behavior that we don't approve of. Therefore, you must have a devil inside you. And we are going to make sure that that goes away meaning your behavior is going to correct itself. Right. And, and yeah. we're going to put you through this traumatic abusive experience to make sure your behavior corrects itself. Yep. The, yeah. The, the, the image I had the, the first times I, I came into contact with, with this um, phenomenon was that the, basically the, the priests had to uh, provide some sort of response for the people who couldn't be controlled because of medical issues. And so they came up with this idea of possession so that they can say, hey, we actually have a solution. We have, we even have the, the origin of the problem, but they, they seem to me uh, like they, they were powerless and just making uh, an excuse of. They, yeah, and, and here's another little fun factoid, the majority, not all, but the majority of people getting exorcisms are female or children, teenage children, of course, and almost and frequently teenage uh, female children. That alone says something in, in, in what the purpose of the exorcism thing is. I, um, I've looked at a whole lot of videos and documentaries and things on exorcism I have only seen one that had a male. It was a young male, probably 20 years old, 21 at, at best. And from what I could tell, and, and again, I can't diagnose from just a video, but I would say the person probably 
you know, had some kind of uh, schizophrenia uh, or, or maybe a, maybe a seizure, uh, some kind of a, a seizure condition. But it, it was a demon possession, that's for sure. But I think you're right, Cindy. It, it's got a control aspect to it. And you can tell because who gets the exorcisms? Well, you rarely go get, uh, you know, the successful businessman who's in depression rarely gets an exorcism. <laughs> yeah. His wife yeah, may, well, his wife may, but uh, not him. <laughs> mm hmm yeah, my, my point was that the, the, the church, especially in uh, in earlier times, they, they couldn't be um, allowed to, to not have a solution to an issue because God is all-knowing. And, and so they, they were the, the representative of, of God on, on, on the society. So if there was something that happened and, and the, the priest said, I don't know what's going on, then he's not infallible and and then that's the beginning of loss of authority and so because of that they had to come up with an explanation for like you said seizures or bipolar people or you know th th those people who have physical um uh symptoms of uh a mental disease and, and so that's what they came up with right yeah when I've watched the uh, interviews, <laughs> of, because of what you guys asked me to do this, I went back and did a few reviews because there that that interview I did is like ten or twelve years old. I I can't remember when I did it, uh, and I I warned you guys not to say anything about how dark my hair was back then. We uh, did. I'll, I'll just say it. it. I'll say it myself. <laughs> but the fact the fact was. I've watched these and I've watched these priests talk about it and they, they, they say it's almost like science. I mean, the one priest literally used that term. It's almost like science. And then I watched another group of four per four people. Uh, one of which was a priest and the other two are Catholic, you know, people that have some authority. I don't know. They weren't priests though. They were like lay people. And then the fourth one was a person who wrote a book on exorcism. And I watched this whole thing and, it, it, they're all kind of wide-eyed. I'll just tell you that they all look like they're half. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to go to them for any advice. But they're talking about how scientific this is, and I think, what's the science here? They said, "Oh, we have this checklist that we go through," and, and one of the one of the items on the checklist was, "You probably are demon possessed if you are afraid to walk into a church." <laughs> Yes, yeah, I remember that in the video. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're afraid to walk into a church, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was in this one, wasn't it? Well, yeah. And, yeah. and, and he had several other things that he was he clicked off. And then I've seen, I saw that panel, and they had seven things that seven things that they were talking about. I don't remember what all seven were, but they they are trying to quote make it look like it's legitimate, that it's scientific, that you can assess it through the, one of these, a checklist, that is, they're usurping science, which yeah. religion, religion does this all the time. In fact, one of the last chapters in my book, The God Virus, I have a whole chapter just on how religion always tries to usurp science. In fact, we even have religions like Scientology and the Church of Christ science. I mean, there's, there's evidence right there just in the name of those religions but it's it's horrible that they're they're trying to legitimize a way of abusing people. Yeah, if if it were scientists scientific, we would not need a priest. We would just go to the doctor and they would give us what we need, right? If it if it worked, then Jesus would have been healing us of our depression for the last two thousand years. Yes, right. But it doesn't work, and so uh, what concerns me about this phenomena is that it in the 1960s and 70s when I was going through my own training uh, you know as a psychologist uh, the, the the notion of supernatural which was really dying down and the notion of exorcism and there was actually the Catholic Church was was downplaying exorcism they didn't deny it but they downplayed it a lot 
However, in the last 20 years, it's come back and Pope Francis has now endorsed exorcism. You know, everybody thinks Pope Francis is such a nice guy, but I got lots of problems with the guy. And this is one of them. He is encouraging. He's even, he's even made official, kind of an official place in the Vatican to, for exorcism guidelines or exorcism training. I mean, you heard in the, you heard in that video that the priest had gone to Rome to get training and that's, it's, 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 um, it's growing. There's more and more exorcism happening. Now the, the problem is it's happening against the poorest and most vulnerable people. They, they don't go into the upper class neighborhoods and at the Catholic church in the upper class neighborhood and advertise, Hey, we're doing exorcisms on Saturday. That's not the way they do it. They go to the poorest of the poor areas. They find a poor child that can't get mental health treatment because their family's too poor or there's no treatment available in the barrios of, of uh, you know, Buenos Aires or, or, you know, Kenya. So the priests are trying to take the place of or play the, play the role of mental health professional and they are absolutely not. Um, yeah. So it's, it's again, the same thing you see all over and over again, religion prays, prays P R E Y S on the poor and the vulnerable. And that's where you see exorcisms happening. Is, are there like, I don't know, any kind of legal guidelines that ever address this? How was, how is, we have a question in the, in the chat. How are, how are people even becoming subject to this? Do they, do they kidnap them? Do they have a family member who's like, please help them and I give you permission? Or how does it usually work? Yeah, there was a good documentary on an exorcist. <laughs> it kind of went door to door. <laughs> it was, it was. I, I laugh, but it's too damn serious. I shouldn't laugh, I guess. Uh, in Argentina, uh, this exorcist was going around and if, if somebody was having trouble with a child, the priest would go talk to him and listen to him. And, you know, with, with the permission of the parents, he'd, he would kidnap the child and take the child off to uh, a secret uh, building that was owned by the church uh, under the control of the church. And that's where they do the exorcism. So this child is not agreeing to this and the parents are having trouble with the child. They don't know what to do with the kid. I mean, maybe he's autistic, maybe he's schizophrenic. You know, there might be some seizure Maybe they're a teenager on. and they don't like listening to their parents. <laughs> yeah, that's probably mostly true there. <laughs> so it it was in that case, it, it was with parental permission, but it was clearly against the will of the child, and it wasn't it wasn't promising any good treatment. It was promising physical torture, uh, tying the child down or holding holding a child down, having three or four adults holding anybody being held down against their will, that is, that feels dangerous. That feels really bad. And then what happens when they hit you or, or they put you in a place, in a position that's very painful? You know, there's, there's lots of ways to be a parent, to be compassionate while torturing somebody. It's for his own good. You, that's what you hear out of the, out of the uh, religious folks all the time. We're, we're basically torturing this child for his own good. Well, that, obviously, if, if the, it, it's obvious that the, the, the child will not agree with this because if he's possessed, obviously the demon inside him is not going to, <laughs> to, to accept that, right? Um, okay, so, Cindy, you, you would make a good Catholic priest. <laughs> But yeah, uh, regard and to to come back to the to the question specifically, the I don't think in the U.S. there is any provision in the law where, uh, especially the child, but but even an, an adult could uh, could do anything against because the, the the religion is extremely protected in in the U.S. Yeah, there's legal legal loopholes for religion all over the place. So you're not going to be able to sue a priest for doing an exorcism. <laughs> and uh, so ostensibly, an exorcism is only done with the permission of the bishop. 
So that's another cover, you know. Well, I only did that because the bishop authorized me to. So go sue the bishop. And then, of course, the bishop is protected by the cardinals and the cardinals by the pope. It's, it's a whole pyramid scheme to legally protect somebody. And, and they can claim I've gone through this, quote, rigorous exorcist training. They don't even the local parish priest in the Catholic Church anyway uh, does not do exorcisms that they're not trained for that. So they have to go off to exorcism school and learn how to properly torture people. I mean, exercise people. And that's what's that's kind of their cover. I'm just doing what the church told me to and I'm just doing what my church trained me to do. It's 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 bad. But I, I want to. I've been picking on the Catholic church because that was the one we, we saw the thing on and that's what I'm most familiar with, but I'm concerned about what's going on in, uh, in places in West Africa where uh, women are being uh, accused of being demon possessed and they're, and they're witches and they're, they will be forced into exorcisms or they will be killed in their local um, villages. And there's entire, there are organizations, I, I'm familiar with one of the organizations. In fact, uh, it's a secular organization has been in Africa, in Nigeria, I believe. No, it's Uganda, I'm sorry. Where they were finding these women and and helping them get out of their village and, and go to like a, a women's halfway house village where there's a whole village of women who all have been accused of being witches. Well, a, a witch is, probably in and was in the United States when we had witch hunts in Salem and all it, it's probably just somebody with a mental illness or a non-conformist somebody who doesn't want to conform to what the local norms are and so they're labeled a deviant and in this case the word for deviant is witch and then they're persecuted for that and they can be persecuted through exorcisms and their children will be persecuted as well. So there's, and, and oftentimes children are the first victims of these exorcisms. But more, more critically, of course, it's all religiously motivated. Whether the, the woman is accused of being a witch and is forced to go through an exorcism, or she's accused of being a witch and she's killed, either one, it's almost always women. It's never, it's never men. And if it is, it's a man that probably has schizophrenia, clearly has schizophrenia or, or a seizure condition of some kind. So let's say um, I, I know someone who went through an, an exorcism. What are the, the possible uh, negative effects on, on this person the, the, the exorcism can, can have? The same effects of somebody being um, imprisoned and tortured, it, it, it's almost indistinguishable. If you look at what would, how would you respond if you were taken into a room with no friends, no allies, and you've got three or four bigger adults than you holding you down, or you're being tied down and you're having people put their hands on you or hitting you and saying horrible things to you, the result of that will be obviously some trauma. And the trauma will manifest itself in, in uh, paranoid behavior. And why wouldn't you be scared of anything and everyone after that kind of a treatment? It, uh, it could also be an extreme withdrawal, even catatonia, you know, be, becoming catatonic. So, I mean, extreme withdrawal to the degree you won't eat. Uh, we see that. It can lead to self-harm, cutting. Cutting and things like that can be a direct result of this kind of abuse. Uh, and and the, 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 the other kinds of uh, sexual, sexual response to this, because there's a sexual component to exorcism, whether, the, uh, whether people admit it or not. So you, oftentimes, your sexual behavior is the reason you got uh, accused of being demon possessed, and even even in the Catholic Catholic tradition, masturbating can be a sign that demons are possessing you. I mean, it's 
it, I'm, I'm, it's true of a lot of religions, but Christianity seems to be particularly good at sexualizing normal human behavior. So, Cindy, the the list of symptoms could go on and on and on. It's all it, it's unique to the human being, the person themselves, how they respond to this stress, and to the type of stress they're put under. There's humans humans can deal with a lot of stress, but once once they've hit their limit, it's like the brain switches. There's a, a switch that goes on or off, you know, it just flips. And that's going to, it, it turns on their, uh, their limbic system. The brain's limbic system gets turned on and it can't get turned off. That's the neuropsychology of it. Limbic, the limbic system is where the fear processing goes on through the amygdala. You know, it's, I'm uh, way oversimplifying this. But the um, sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated and it can't turn itself off. We all, when we lay down to go to sleep, we switch, our brain switches from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. That's how you go to sleep. You relax. That's what the parasympathetic nervous system does. But what if your sympathetic nervous system has been so heightened, so stimulated, that you're afraid of every noise, you know, if everything that touches your body, just laying down in bed, pulling the covers over may stimulate you. That's, that's the kind of thing people experience after something like this. Now, of course, they are showing you on, the, on these TV shows and documentaries, they're showing the quote, successful exorcisms. Now, we don't know what happened to that woman after that movie, after the documentary is finished. Five years later, who knows? She might be in a mental institution now. I don't know. Or she may be fine. Maybe she got the placebo effect worked on her. I don't know. But the fact is, she is, they only show us the successes. And I doubt if there's very many of those. How many people are out there that are walking damaged people because of these damn exorcisms and the whole notion of you are broken and you're filled with demons. Now that's, that's the last thing mental health treatment looks like. Especially if they don't like notice any difference in themselves, you know, if they like, they complete their little ritual and they say, now you're cured. And the person's like, but I still feel like me. So then <laughs> what does that say about who, who I am as a person? Oh yeah, it's always your fault. Yeah, yeah. You 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 let the demon stay in you. You didn't listen to us when we were trying to give you Jesus. It's like Benny Hinn and his his healing. You know, he comes up and he throws people down on the floor, and they walk. You know, they get up and walk away, and they're healed of cancer. Or they're healed of whatever you could not diagnose in the first place. <laughs> he never heals the people. Uh, you know, the wheelchairs. Uh, that, that haven't walked in 20 years, uh, who had polio or something like that. Uh, it's it's the same way with exorcists. They only show you th the ones they want you to, to see. It's count the hits and ignore the misses. Uh-oh, we have been visited by a demon there. That is a demon if I ever saw That's one. That's a real demon, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have scars on my leg from a demon I used to have. <laughs> I, I have scars on both arms. Oh, there you go. Yep, yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's the, this uh, famous movie, The um, the Exorcism of Emily Rose, which is uh, an adaptation of, of the story of a real, uh, real woman, a German woman con called Annalise Michel. And that woman, I think she went through 64 or 67 exorcism over yeah. uh, 10 months. Um, and, and so, first of all, there's, at, at one point, does uh, the, the, the priest say, uh, or, or doesn't they say, okay, we are not equipped to, to deal with this, and there's obviously something else, or do they say, um, we are not strong enough, or I, I, I don't understand how someone can fail 67 times and still try to do the same thing. You, you know, the, the, this famous quote from, um, from Einstein, right? What did you say, Charlotte? 
Oh, just say, like, why are we even going to 67? Like, after <laughs> two or three or five, like, it's all no. this isn't well, uh, why don't you go to do something So else? that, that, I will say, that is the um, rationalist mistake. Mm -hmm. Because you're being logical. And logic <laughs> is not what's going on here. Someone yeah. who has experienced trauma, and I'm talking PTSD, trauma not not just you know i had a bad day it's that is deeply embedded emotionally into the brain uh i there's and, and there's a lot of people walking around that look perfectly normal in our society that are uh, that respond or are, are are affected by trauma they had earlier in life and they effectively hide it but it's there all the time and it affects their decisions. And one of those decisions is how do I deal with this feeling I've got all the time? I want to get rid of this feeling. I want to get rid of this. They don't call it trauma. They don't know it. They don't know that's what it is, but it's a horrible feeling that they carry around, even as they look perfectly happy and normal. And so they go back and they try it over and over again. They tr maybe try a different exorcist or they try a different, and you, you see it in medicine too. You see people trying one drug or another drug, or they try illegal drugs, and they do that 64 times too. It, it's the same, it's probably the same thing going on. I have this horrible feeling inside. I can't tell anybody about it. I don't know what it is. How do I get rid of it? And people, people can't do that by themselves. They need they need real help from a from a therapist that knows how to treat those kinds of things. And unfortunately, as I said earlier in our show today, that I just finished touring all of Australia talking about religious trauma. And what we're talking about right now today, exorcism, if that isn't religious trauma, if that isn't traumatizing from a religion, I don't know what is. That is like the quintessential level of religious trauma because the, the source of that trauma probably was the religion in the first place. You may be getting an exorcism at the age of 25 years old, but why are you behaving like that? It's because a priest molested you when you were 10 years old or you were raped by a, by a religious leader. You know, there's probably that happened and that's related to a religious leader by a priest and then later they're going to come back and say oh we can cure the disease that we gave you <laughs> that's really what they're uh the church is saying yeah <clears throat> repeating it 67 times like at that point like it's quite obviously not about curing at that point but about control right it 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 is about curing but unsuccessful curing <laughs> mm -hmm. these i i you were in a mental, you, you've been into a mental health facility. You've, you've seen people that had clearly serious mental health issues mm -hmm. and you've seen how they repeat the same behaviors over and over again, even self-destructive behaviors that, that tells you the brain isn't processing information very well. It's processing in the same way. It's like uh, another way to look at it. I've known, I've known women who have married four different alcoholic husbands in their lifetime. Why would you keep doing that? Why do you keep repeating this mistake of marrying someone who's abusing a drug who then turns around and abuses you? Well, if you look at it as logic, it makes no sense. If you look at it as childhood trauma and you ask the person, usually if you can get a clinical interview with them, you may find out that they were sexually abused as a child or their father was an alcoholic and she loved her father, but he abused her. You know, that love hate thing going on there. I think it's important for us as secularists and atheists to, to approach this compassionately. And, you know, as angry as I am at the Catholic church, I'm not angry at that woman. She's simply trying to get healing She's trying to get some relief from the internal pressure she feels. I'm angry. I'm not even angry at the priest so much because 
priests are themselves victims of a really insidious system. So we, we have to start somewhere and we can't start with just blaming people and say, you're stupid or you're ignorant or you're illogical. That doesn't help anybody. Um, I, I, I could go on and on and on, but that's my approach to this stuff. I get pissed off about it, but I don't get pissed off the humans. I get pissed off at the system that's creating these humans. Uh, and that's, that's an important distinction in my, in my mind. Well, I can't agree more because uh, as it turned out, uh, tomorrow I will be on um, uh, the nonprofits and we had this exact uh, discussion about compassion and being angry, angry at the system and not the people. So yes, I, I totally agree. Um, Charlotte, you are going to say something? I don't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, so during your tour in um, in Australia, how many demons have you faced? <laughs> uh, I saw these weird demons that were on uh, hopping around on two legs, and they're almost as tall as me. <laughs> uh, well, I I didn't I didn't see any, but in in many cultures they they believe that that. Um, Things, things have personalities. A tree has a personality. A kangaroo has a personality, which they do actually. And so, if if you're a if you're a member of a of a culture, a Aboriginal culture, let's say in in Australia or a, or Amazonian culture in 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 the um, jungles, South you know, America. of South America, right? Then you see the world as having agency. And you attribute that agency to that tree or, or to that rock or to that um, peccary or that kangaroo. And, and you interact with your world as it, as it has agency. And that's actually not unhealthy. It's survivable because in most cultures, agency in that sense means you understand the patterns of the deer. You understand the patterns of the kangaroo. So that when it comes time to find a kangaroo to kill and eat, you know what to do with that. And you have a spiritual obligation to that kangaroo and to the spirits of the kangaroo. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very respectful way to interact with the world. Um, and I, I'm not saying it's logical necessarily, but it, it, it says, okay, the world acts in this way. And within their confines, it's pretty accurate. You know, that, that tree gives fruit at this time of year, but only if you water it and pray, you know, okay, you may not need to do the prayer, but, but it still works. And that's all that matters to, to them. Fast forward, you know, a few thousand years or whatever. And you've got a culture that now has understands how that tree works and why the kangaroos come through at that time of the year. And we have a scientific ability to observe, but we still, tend to put agency on things. And it's this, it's this need to put agency on things that can backfire on us, um, at least in my opinion. The, the schizophrenic, the person who's experiencing a schizophrenic episode sees things and attributes agency and interacts with them. Probably, there's actually evidence that the people who became priests in, in many many cultures were schizoaffective people. They, they were like, it's, it's hard to explain, but a, a schizoaffective disorder, so to speak, is like got many of the characteristics of schizophrenia, except they can, they, they think they can see things and hear things and they can communicate and they don't act too, um, non-conforming to the culture. They can still interact with the culture. And so you get behavior that has been seen by many culture as spiritual. So these people become the priests. These people become the shaman of a, of a given culture. And they can read the tree and they can tell you whether the stars are going to do this or that because of this agency thing. And I, I could go on and on. There's really interesting anthropological stories about these things 
And once you understand all the anthropology and how other cultures have treated people who, what we would say, have mental illness, you realize that, yeah, it's, it may be mental illness, but it can also be functional. There's functionality to some of these things. And, and then we also look at depression and realize that depression is a Western thing. <laughs> Uh, a, a tribal member in Amazon, they don't really know what depression is. You get up in the morning, you go out, you hunt for your food, you bring it home, you feed your family. Um, you don't lay in bed feeling depressed. So there, there's probably things going on based upon just the, the social environment that is causing the depression. I, so if you want to, and you're, I, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going way too far off topic, but yeah. It, well, it, it's still still interesting because we we, we understand that um, humans, uh, like you said, are very complex. That the brain is extremely complex, and and we know frighteningly little about how the brain works. But we still learn at at uh, almost uh, an exponential. Uh, uh, speed about the brain, and so what what we uh, define as disease sometimes is uh, tainted by our culture. Like homosexuality was uh, was deemed as as a mental disease for for a long time. Yeah, like totally. being transgender also is is considered uh, as a mental disease. So yes, we we we, we understand that culture can. Um, can have an effect on, on the view of mental health yeah. uh, in, in the society. Uh, and and, and it, it, well, with respect to exorcism, think about this. We have, it hasn't been that long ago, well, it's still around, the whole pray the gay away stuff, forcing children to go off to, to camps to keep them from being gay or pray the gay out of them. How is that not different? How's that any different than an exorcism? It, it is very similar to an exorcism. It may not look like it, but that's what it's doing. You're trying to get the demon of gayness out of you, you know, or get the demon of transgenderism out of you. That's what's going on here. And, and in that sense, we have finally figured out that should be illegal. And many states have now uh, made that illegal inside of their states or, or cities, but it still exists. And there's people doing it under the table, hiding it, trying to, do it anyway and that is torture to gay children torture to transgender children um, so in some ways the legal system still allows it because of religious exemptions of course i i, I jumped in there uh, cindy I, did i interrupt you no 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 you, you answered my question oh, oh okay okay yeah i think this whole pray the gay way should be looked at just like exorcisms it's it's just as bad there is a, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, this sounds off topic, but it's really not. In Utah, there's a whole cottage industry of, of these camps and ranches where people send their children to pray the gay away or to pray or, or to uh, stop their quote sex addiction. Uh, can you imagine a 12 year old, 14 year old kid being accused of being a sex addict? <laughs> I mean, number one, they probably haven't had sex to begin with. All they're doing is masturbating, which is perfectly normal. But they're being vilified and terrorized by their family and their parents. And oh, by the way, a lot of these children are adopted children. They're not the biological children of the family. So they're saying, oh, this 12-year-old is masturbating too much. I catch him almost every day. So let's send him off to Utah to pray, pray his masturbation away and make sure he's not gay. And so the Utah camps with master's level social workers in their staff and running the whole organization, I, I can send, I could put links up to these places. They then diagnose you and then, or the kid rather, and charge the insurance company. Now, if you look in the DSM, there is no, <laughs> there's no demon possession. There's no anti-gay. There's no, um, Sex, sex addiction diagnosis. None of those things can be diagnosed in the DSM. 
So these these organizations diagnose the child with a with a norm, quote normal diagnosis like depression, and then they send the paperwork off to the insurance company to get reimbursed for treating the child for depression. But they tell the family, "We're going to treat your child for sex addiction. We're going to we're going to treat your child for being gay." I mean, that's literally what's going on. They're billing the insurance company for one thing, and they're telling and doing something very different to the child by way of the parents. It's insidious. So, so, so it's fraud in, in top of harming the children, basically. Yep, yep. And, and these, like I said, a lot of these children are adopted. They weren't, they're not the biological children of these parents. So a lot of children, of course, that are adopted are coming out of some pretty bad situations from infancy. So it's, is it any surprise they're going to have issues, you know, in, in adolescence when their hormones start flowing? Well, and they almost probably very likely have trauma. Yes. You know, right. Right. From being adopted in the first place and from, you know, who knows if they're being treated well, but their adoptive families they aren't always. No, they're not. You're right. There is an interesting, uh, uh, just for mental health purposes, I want to tell your audience this. There isn't very good uh, test you can go and, and take. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences, ACE test. Uh, just Google it. It's on the Center for Disease Control. Uh, created this test. It's been around for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years. It's based on really good long-term research. And what it does is it it asks you, I think it's only like nine questions or 10 questions, not very many questions. You can take the test and from that test, it'll say you experienced this level of adverse childhood experiences. That does not mean that you were traumatized, but it means you were your uh, environment or your childhood produced potentially traumatizing experiences. Uh, there's mitigating things. For example, if if a child is going through some strong adverse experiences, but they have a very loving, caring family around them, uh, you know, let's say death of a parent, which is pretty adverse, but they have a good substitute. Maybe it was a father who died, but they have a substitute uncle that can come in and, and kind of take that place. There's mitigating circumstances that would make mean that the adverse experience does not lead to adult trauma. But in many cases, adverse childhood experiences, especially at a certain level, lead to adult trauma. And that's when you need to get treated. You, you need to recognize that and then find somebody who's competent to treat your trauma rather than going to an exorcism 64 times <laughs> or whatever that was. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, just a little little hint. Go go look it up. Ace the Ace test. Okay. Well, uh, we've reached uh, and and passed the the hour mark. So I don't want to uh, to stay here too long. Uh, so again, thanks very very much, Dr. Ray, for uh, coming here. It was always always is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. I, I'm sorry I didn't let you talk too much. That's okay. <laughs> I, 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 I know I, I had some questions ready to um, to, to there. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm going to to leave you the the, the last word because you have experience uh, uh, of um, de dealing with people with with trauma and uh, and psycholo psychological issues. So go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> just bring it on me. Um, <laughs> just to wrap up the show. Um, I mean, yes, if if you're struggling, if you definitely um, go see a mental health professional and not a priest for an exorcism, because the mental health professional will no doubt be able to help you much more. <laughs> um, but yeah, fun. again, it's not a one size fits all thing. So, yeah. but. Therapy generally works better than exorcism. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, Daryl, you, you mentioned some uh, events that, uh, that are going to take place in, in the next couple of months. You want to? Uh, yeah, yeah let, me, 
let me say go to go to um, maybe I should put the link in here. Yes, please, please consider donating to our our fundraiser. It's the main way we fund ourselves throughout the year. You can go directly to Recover from Religion or RFR.org. I think we've got the fundraiser link there. Recover from Religion.org. And then the excursions coming up in September and the excursion. Let me just double check. The September dates are the 22nd through the 24th is outside of um, Pigeon, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And we are about, I will just say, if you're interested, check it out real quick because my treasurer told me just yesterday that we we're about 80% full. So that's the earliest we've ever been that full. So we sold out. We've sold out the last two years. And it looks like we're going to sell out this year, too. Uh, and there's two levels. You can you can buy a full attendance with a room and a bed and all the food and everything. Or you can just attend. Uh, but you'll have to find your own lodging. Um, you can camp out in a tent. Uh, there's a campground down the road a little ways. But whatever works for you, we would love to see people come and just join us in deconstructing, um, understanding what our journey is and hearing what other people's journey is and hearing some good speakers that that can, can help you heal and hear how other people are healing. So thanks, Cindy, for having me on today. Um, appreciate having you, you on too, Charlotte. It's good to have somebody with that kind of experience in the, in the discussion too. Yeah, it's, it's good to have someone who actually knows anything about the topic not like me <laughs> and, um, and, and go look at my books the sex of god and the god virus what i didn't tell everybody uh, uh cindy was i actually have a very strong example from the movie the exorcist i write about it in sex and god because there's some real interesting parallels between the way religious people behave and what you we see in the exorcist but i won't go into that we're uh, that'd take too much time Anyway, okay. Um, I would like also to thank uh, everyone who's been uh, interacting with us in the chat. Uh, if you like the show, you can obviously come to show to to watch us at this time uh, and interact with the chat. It's always very very lively. We have questions usually. Uh, you can also uh, comment below the video uh, if you find the topic interesting or if you even disagree with what we uh, say here. Um, we. Also would like to thank the, the Patreons uh, because we have a Patreon account and you can donate if you want. Uh, so the Patreons are Sydney Davis Jr., uh, Eric Ozols, Tara S., Rian, Daniel Murphy, Dan D., Michael Wiseman, Kathy Cotton, CD Plaza, Saint Shell, Aaron Colson, and Phil Calderon. Uh, and so thanks everyone here. I would also like to thank very, very much the, the producers because I always forget to do that and uh there wouldn't be any show uh uh if it weren't for them i would uh also like to thank my two cats who've been wrecking havoc in the apartment <laughs> during the show and uh so you can come and watch us here at uh, skeptic heaven and more specifically at women atheist and load every saturday at 3 30 uh, p.m central and uh, I hope I will see you there next time. Bye. I'll never slow up. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'll always show up. I don't never slow up. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'll always show up. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. I don't never slow up. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. Wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up and make a statement Everything I do so instinctive and so passionate